Hello everybody, thank you uh, and uh, I apologise for being late and uh, it's quite strange that we are all up on this former Royal Hill, you know, can you imagine? The way we use this hill today, it's completely, uh, I mean, it, it kind of is, it's um, not many, not many, uh, you see, if you look at uh, Singapore as a maritime uh, port city, there are not many in the world that uh, really on the, f uh, facing a water body as busy as ours and having this vantage hill. So it's really a very special site. And actually in the Malay world, you find quite a number of these sites, you know, but many of them are actually riverines. So for example, Palembang is 100 kilometers up the Musi River, but it's navigable by ships, unlike our Singapore River. So I mean, what I'm saying is this is a very unique site and to be on top of a hill too, uh, very interesting. I'm gonna move this slightly because, so that I can uh, stand here, yeah. A bit, the height is a bit strange. Okay, that's better so that it's below me. Um, so today, I have been asked to do something. Um, I think it's partly because I'm, I'm a very naughty person. For the first, and you know that this, this, this series of lectures has to do, is connected with the whole 700 years Singapore history project. And the first edition uh, was something that I uh, critiqued uh, previously in uh, 2015 uh, at a public uh, event uh, organized by Singapore Urban Lab. It was called Singapore Dreaming. Some of you might know about this. You can find it online. My lecture in full is there. Uh, in that, I was, it was quite a severe criticism I made about the book, uh, Singapore 700 Years in its uh, first edition. Uh, the reason I criticized it were manifold, was manifold. Uh, it was, and it was also a kind of critique against uh, this idea of four different uh, major turning points in Singapore's history. And uh, I responded to these four turning points by referring to counterpoints uh, that were dissonant, as well as developments that were parallel to Singapore that we, in our very narrow and ahistorical uh, nationalist uh, boundary of looking at the past, totally miss out. Meaning that uh, we look at Singapore's history on the very narrow premise of the city-state boundaries today, or the island city-state boundaries. And so many of the questions we ask ourselves have a degree of, I wouldn't say absurdity, have a degree of, uh, have, have a prob it's problematic. It's, uh, it's, it's phrased in a problematic way. And so because of that, uh, one of the things I pointed out was that in the 18th century, and that's the reason I'm standing before you here today, one of, the, one of my key, key criticisms was the first edition, not in the second one, eh? the first edition totally omitted any mention of the fact that in the 18th century, the British country traders, which included somebody like Francis Light, who founded Penang for the EIC, right? The British country traders in the 18th century were actively involved in the trade of the Straits region up to China. And where did they resort to for trade? Not Dutch Malacca, Riau. Riau port, which was extremely wealthy at that point, uh, it was under the management of the Malay and the Bugis. And that was not mentioned at all in the book. Right? So it seems as though there's terra nullis around us and we were a sleepy, sleepy fishing village and then suddenly you know, we were saved by the glorious British Empire. Not, re not yet, but the East India Company. And it's, uh... So it was not like that at all. So in the new edition, um, Riau has been included. Riau has been included and so has the 1784 destruction of Riau. But it's still not enough. There are a lot of things that are not uh, included, and I would suggest a few of these things that could be included in our uh, frame of view. Yeah? So um, that is the reason I'm here, as I mentioned, because of that criticism, and also because I, I advocate for a broadened, what I call here, Straits Malay perspective. And also, of course, when we look at century as a frame for looking at history, you know it's artificial. I mean, who decides? Who? It just so happens that you know, we use the dates like this. If you refer to other calendars, what's a century? It's a different thing, right? Yeah, but this era, for example, this. So, what, so beyond that quibble, what I mean is the time frame. So 18th century, okay, what exactly does that mean? Does it really, really start at 1800 and then 1700 to 1799? Well, not really. So I would like to use two events from various historians' perspectives, uh, 1699, you might be very familiar, is the regicide, a cataclysmic event uh, for all intents and purposes for the Straits Malay population who owed their allegiance to the line of kings who purport to have been descended from Bukit Seguntang Mahamaru's 
rulers, which is elaborated at great length in the text called Sulalatu Salatin of Sejarah Melayu, in which you find references to 14th century Singapore. So 1699 as a starting point, and it will be uh, clear later. But we can just start the, the, the discussion there, so I will go back a little bit to show you the prelude to that. And then 1819, if you read people like, and I really, really, I brought his book just to show you. This is a pioneering work. Okay, I, the, the title is a bit misleading, and it plays into the stereotypes and kind of, uh, I mean, plays into, but he did it deliberately. Mind you, it's in his practice. The Prince of Pirates by Carl Trockey. Now, he, when he wrote this in 1979, well, you can correct me if I forget. 1979, I think, it was a pioneering work. Nobody at that time looked at Singapore the way he did. I, I, I urge you to read it. So a lot of what I'm going to say uh, owes, my, owes it to him. The other person I would like to really, and I, unfortunately I don't have the book because now it's available in e-version. He might be a bit dismayed to hear this, is um, Leonard Andaya. I don't have, like I said, but it's available now. Uh, History of Johor, but I will be referring specifically uh, to uh, his work for a chapter in the 1984 a uh, weekly and sandu volume for Malacca, in which he talks about the uh, Dutch period of Malacca's history and where he talks about the, the um, 17th and early 18th century context of the trade contest between Dutch Malacca and the uh, Malay, and then later the Bugis at uh, Johor and Riau. Okay, that was a very long preamble, perhaps a little longer than I expected. I mentioned to you earlier that this is something I'm not going to read out, but this was something I presented at that uh, event in 2015 when I was talking about a, the very problematic narrow perspective that we have uh, when we talk about the 700 year history and then we look at it so narrowly from Singapore. Uh, I wanted to point out two things. Singapore's uh, brilliance today as an international trade port in Southeast Asian history is no new thing. Throughout its history, you know Sriwijaya was such. If you read Chinese and Arab accounts, they all talked about Sriwijaya and the Malayu king. The, they didn't call it Malayu, but they call it the Sriwijaya king who spoke this language that was along the straits. The Chinese said the same thing. Right? All the people of the straits speak the same language, blah, blah, blah. It's nothing new. Nothing new. Singapore is in the tradition of a long line of international trade ports, except previously, and Carl Trocki says this, it was under the management of Malays. That's all. Right? And so for you to ask, or for me to ask, was Singapore a mere fishing village? Oh, come on, what, is, what kind of question is that? That's ridiculous because you don't, that, that means you don't understand the larger context of the straits. Singapore is but one possible location for a port. And the major international entrepreneurs of the past were in various locations along the straits. Right? Whether it was at Palembang, whether it was at Jambi, which was called Malayu, whether Riau was the last one, Riau. Right? And so it's, it's not unique. And if you think about Malacca, Malacca, you know, how many of us here, or not us, maybe you're not here, how many of the elite in Singapore today trace their descent to the Malaccans? Haja Fatima was from Malacca, very wealthy. She owned property in Malacca as well. All the wealthy Babas of Singapore, the Chinese Babas, they're all from Malacca. So they migrated over, the next big thing, they knew it. Right? So we are, we're not a direct successor state, but the position we are in is a long, has a long history. Okay, there's a long pedigree. I'm not saying a direct descent, but this is not like how Thailand's, uh, you know, how Thailand talks about Ayutthaya, uh, Sukhothai Ayutthaya, and you know that this is, I wonder how much of this will be edited out of the recording, you know. But anyway, yeah, I, I wonder, I should have done my own voice recording. I hope some of you are doing that, I'll, I'll get it from you. But, um, so I was saying that, you know, it's, it's, it's very myopic to, uh, to look at Singapore like that, and then ask, oh, you know, where were we? You know, we, as though we were here in 15th century, come on. Where were we? What was the Singapore story? You know, what developed in the 18th century to allow us to understand our trajectory? Is it our trajectory? Come on, if we are cosmopolitan in our thinking, we don't think like that. Come on, that's a silly question. And to say 700 years of Singapore history and think like that is a bit strange one. If you are a citizen of the world, or, or, or shall, dare I say the region, then we wouldn't be asking these questions. Right? It will be bigger than that because you know what? One day, what if, just like the Malaccans of the 18th century, we migrate to the next big thing? Ha ha ha. Of course, this is not something you would like to hear, but in the longer trajectory of history, this is what happens. Right? I know this is not a popular thing to say, but, but this is what I'm saying. From, from the larger perspective, that's how it happened. Yeah? If you want to say we, then you've got to have an affinity, you know, some kind of affinity with Sriwijaya, Malayu, Malacca, Aceh, Johor, and Riau. Would you like to do that? 
then we can talk about we. Right? Then we can talk about we. So I, my aim is towards a richer understanding of our region's long history and Singapore's position in it beyond the neocolonial frames and gaze that we have inherited. Especially asking whether it was you know, better under British colonialism or Dutch. That kind of question does not apply. So I'm, not, I'm going to skip this, but I was talking about how you can talk about parallel and dissonant perspectives and how we have very problematic inheritance of how we frame our history. We keep asking whether the British was better, you know, whether the Napoleonic Wars led to this and that. We never ask what happened to the region. We never do. Right? So my, my, my response for the 18th and early 19th century, in other words, that long 18th century I'm talking about, up to 1819, and actually up to 1824, the end of tripartite rule in Singapore, 1824 was when uh, the EIC, the East India Company, acquired the whole island, not just the town. Initially, the EIC only had Tanjong Malang, which is near Tanjong Paga, to Tanjong Katong. Right? Tanjong Katong, you know, it's very strange. Tanjong Katong. Um, and Tanjung Katong is really a Tanjung, it's a promontory. There's a part of the old coastline which turned, and that turn is Tanjung Katong. So it's a precise point. Um, so Tanjung means cape. Um, and uh, yeah, so this was, this, this was my point at that, at that uh, meeting and the parallel and the, the, the other perspective. Right? So the other perspective is this, sometimes I find it insulting, you know, this thing about like our oh, Malays, you know, they are like, they are fishing villages. There was, there's never any understanding of the trade role of Malays and other Southeast Asian indigenous, never. I don't hear it in the books. Um, contextualizing Singapore. So I'm going to go through uh, this lecture in six parts. The first part will be to contextualize what we understand as Singapura. So please, it's not about that fishing village. All right, can you please rethink how you assume what Malay Singapura means and understand the region and understand the role of the Malays and the Bugis in this long history of trade. We have to understand that. And don't keep asking whether the EIC did this, whether the... Yeah, yeah, you can ask those questions. It's been done to death, all right? But if we took the other perspective, now you realize it'll be more difficult. It'll be more difficult. So first I want to ask, who lived on Singapore? Who were its denizens? Who were its denizens? Do we know? Are they still with us? I want to start with a big context. You can't just talk about Singapore on its own. I repeat this many, many times. So let's look at three sources, one from one is Joao de Barros, who wrote in the 1560s. The second one is William Marsden from 1784. And then John Crawford, summarizing somewhat, but also adding his own elements of organization in 1856. Now, all of these people talk about the whole straits. In fact, what they call the Malay nation, or whatever appellation they call it. Right? Later, we'll come to an 18th century Chinese source, because all these are white men. Later, we'll come to a source written by the Chinese, a Chinese author, rather. Wang Gangwu wrote this paper. So again, I want to pay tribute to as many people as I can. So this is Wang Gangwu. Can you believe it? I photocopied this from the Journal of the Historical Society of the University of Malaya when I was still an undergrad. And I kept on to it for these, all these number of years. Maybe those who only know PDF today will not know the value of these things. You know, I held on to this for dear life. Because there's no e version of Journal of the Historical Society. And the scholarship from the 1950s and 60s, the Malayan culture kind of, we've lost it, man. We've completely lost it. And I will come back to this point later. But first, we listen to the white man, all right? So the white man tells us, and it's true, this, the Malays also understand this. If you look at Malay sources, which I omitted from here, um, there are at least three ways to classify, if you like, the Malay nation. Because they all spoke the Malay language, but actually, they're three very different folks. One folk, please pardon the politically very incorrect language. Very incorrect language, OK? Please pardon this. The civilized Malays who have a written language and make decent progress in the useful arts, that's the Melayu. Another kind of Melayu, the gypsy-like fishermen, the sea people orang laut. And then the rude half-savages who live in the forest, the orang benua, orang asli. This is very politically incorrect, but that's how they viewed it. Actually, the Malays also viewed it that way. And in the Malay text, they will call the letter two categories, Sakai or whatever other terms. Sakai actually had no derogatory term in the past. It comes from the Sanskrit meaning companion. But it is clear that there was a hierarchy, all right? So, I mean, it's very politically incorrect, but, and then he elaborated the civilized Malays, they are in eastern Sumatra, interior of the island, the seaboards of Borneo and the Malay Peninsula. The, fun, the, the fundamental point is the emphasis was on Sumatra, because that's where the Malayu are from. And Malacca's account also, the Malayu are from Sumatra, not, not, I mean, they migrated over, but it's not that they were also not indigenous to uh, Borneo and Malay Peninsula's sea coasts, they were. And then the sea gypsies, uh, you know, live on their boats exclusively, and then 
this reference to the robberies, also on top of your phishing, and so, and, and so you see this trope persisted. And so he says, these three classes, just to justify his point, huh, writing in 1856, these three classes existed near three centuries and a half ago when the Portuguese first arrived in the waters of the archipelago, just as they do at the present. So he's saying it's always been like that. Okay, even the Portuguese say the same thing, so you can trust me. Right? So, and then if you listen to the Portuguese, well, I'm not going to elaborate. You've already taken, many of you have taken a photo. So, I mean, you read it, it's clear what they're talking about. Now, how about Singapore? Singapore is home to whom? Only Orang Laut or also Melayu? Ah. Well, I'm not going to answer the question. We don't, yeah, but, but you get what I mean, yeah? That, 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 that they are all the same and yet they're different. So don't tell me, oh, Orang Laut is not Melayu. So Melayu is not indigenous. Lah. Indigenous to Singapore is only Orang Laut. Melayu are migrants. Don't tell me that. The whole region. What? You, you, who, who is migrant to the region then? It's the whole region. Okay, don't be that myopic. I, I've, heard, I've heard in Malaysia the same issues. People saying, oh, Melayu pendatang. Lah. Orang asli aja yang, yang asli. You know, only the aborigines in the forest are native. You know, the Malays all migrated. Nonsense. It's three different groups together, right? So, I mean, that's a long way to kind of belabor the point. But if you read Finlay's, Finlayson's account in 1821, it's very interesting. Again, all the politically incorrect language, never mind. The condition of the lower class of Malays in these parts, which he later says, this description of Malays goes by Orang Laut. So he's here talking about the Orang Laut. All of their life on a wretched little canoe, he says, they're fishing. An inconceivable number of them live in this manner, in the boats, a wretched little canoe, wretched manner. They don't live on land, they're constantly roving about. They sell whatever they catch to the fixed inhabitants. These are the Melayu and other groups, not just Melayu, of course. Taking rice, sago, beetle, and cloth in return. So we get this description. And it's interesting, he says, an inconceivable number. And that they are in, sorry, where is that? Um, almost, uh, sorry, he says that they are in numerous bays, inlets, and creeks that surround Singapore. That means all across. So there are many different groups. Uh, and, um, and then he contradicts everything he said earlier, being the condescending white man that he is. He says, a number of the people called Orang Laut were brought to us for inspection. Can you believe yourself? Let's all Singaporeans being inspected, right? I'm being inspected, you are being inspected. We are in superior condition, in appearance more civilized than many of whom he had seen in the base and creeks remote from the horns of men. What does all this say? But what it does say is he feels that the Orang Laut of Singapore are, what, what did he say again? Superior in condition, in appearance, more civilized. Ah, what is it? So, more civilized and superior Orang Laut of Singapore. Give it some pride. It's, I mean, we can't run away from this. We are not post colonial yet, yes, yet, so this is my attempt. So, Orang Laut at Singapore River, now, if we listen to Gibson Hill, who has done so many studies that are important in the 50s and 60s that we need to dig into again, okay? Otherwise, we just forget all the work that he has done. There were at least about 100 inhabited boats of the uh, Orang Laut at Singapore, sorry, of them, besides their larger sailing vessels. So 100 of inhabit, uh, home boats, and then lots more of sailing vessels, such as the Prahu Panjang or Sampat Panjang, which he also uh, goes to great lengths to describe. Um, and then later in the 1840s, they all were dispersed under Governor Bonham. So 450 moved to Tanjung Wu. Recently, the Tanjung Wu, I, I got in touch with them five years ago, and then recently, about one year back or two years back, they came into the limelight, a newspaper article, and so on. The, the Orang, Laut, uh, Orang, Orang, Selat, Orang Laut at Singapore River, who moved to Tanjung Wu, later had to move again to Lorong 3 Kampung Puchai, Gelang, Lorong 3 Gelang. Um, and to, and they, they are still in touch with each other, so as a community. So they are actually the, the original Singapore River in, uh, among the many. Other groups disperse elsewhere, but one remained cohesive in a, with a batin. Yeah, with a penghulu and a batin. Uh, so that's, that's the Singapore River kind of uh, orang, orang Salat. Um, moving further in front, uh, further forward now, uh, just to go beyond a little bit, and I'm not going to elaborate, Orang Laut communities, just, I'm just going to highlight three points. Orang Kalang, for example. I mean, we have this imagination. The book, unfortunately, the new edition of 700 years perpetuates this image by reproducing very stereotypical images of Orang Laut. Uh, there are many other ways to represent them, please. It, it, I mean, we need, to, we need to think about how we represent them as very much other. So the Orang Kalang, for example, is well known for the violinist Dolmat and his son, another celebrated violinist. And the Orang, Orang uh, Laut 
and the Melayu have their own versions of the same Melayu Asli songs. I know this goes over the head of many of us because we are no longer Malayan, right? So we don't know anything about this. But, but, but yes. So there are two distinct traditions within Melayu Asli songs: the Orang Laut version and the Melayu version. Yeah. Um, and in the Bodleian Library, there is in the colophon of a work Kampung Sungai Kalang, for example. Yeah, where the, the and Kampung Sungai Kalang is really an Orang Laut uh, settlement. You can go back to the archives and you will find in one of the location tickets a list issued by Raffles the names of all the Orang Kalang, Orang Sungai Kalang. And they all go by C something, which is a very Orang Laut uh, way of naming themselves. C something, C, this one, C, this one. In Malay, C is, is very similar to Hokkien. Huh? C, C Gina, all that C, right? There are, you know? C, in Malay, C is the, or him who is, or her who is. Yeah, it's a kind of, not a title, but an appellation to a name. Like, I don't know how to put it. It's just a designation. It's better than just saying your name. Like you say, hey, si Imran tu eh. Like that Imran, eh? like that, the C. Okay, so, I mean, I won't, I won't elaborate on the rest. It's all very fascinating. It's like a whole chapter by itself. But I want to also remind us the nuances should also be applied when speaking of Chinese, Bugis, Malay, Arab, and so on, because it, it's very nuanced. So, for example, even in Riau, by the 18th century, end of the 18th century, we can speak of the Peranakan Bugis because the, versus the Bugis Toto, who just arrived. They are very different. Peranakan Bugis already regard, regard themselves as they speak Malay, they no longer speak the Bugis language and so on. Or they speak the Bugis language but regard Malay as the home language. Doesn't that sound familiar? Yeah. Okay. And it's not only about direct ancestral lineages and essentializing ourselves in terms of our cultures. There's a lot more to that. I know acculturation is some, not something you force, but what I'm saying is if the ACM, I'm, I'm going to talk about ACM now, was set up with the purpose of reminding us of our ancestral cultures. Maybe it needs to be attenuated a little bit because for many of us, ancestral cultures would be a drawback rather than a moving forward. I don't know whether you get what I mean. If you are Pranakan, whatever, not just Pranakan Chinese, to be told that your ancestral language is this one might be a step back rather than a step forward because you live in this region now. You live in this region now. Why are we talking about ancestral whatever like that? If you did that in the US, you think that would be a good thing? Then Trump can tell you, go back to where you came from. <laughs> but maybe we like that, I don't know. We like to be able to tell ourselves where we came from and then like essentialize ourselves in that narrow way. So then there will never be a Singaporean culture, right? Yeah, I don't know. I, so there's all of this very nuanced uh, migration of long residence and acculturation. A lot of the Chinese who came to Singapore in the early years were not even from China. They were from neighboring port cities, Samarang. You know somebody came from Samarang, right? I don't know whether you get my reference. Yeah? Yeah, so, so Chinese from Samarang. Arab from Palembang. Hmm. How long have they been in Samarang and Palembang, respectively? Many generations. Right? That's ancestral language. Uh, that's ancestors' uh, lineage for you. Not China, not, uh, not Yemen, but the region. Right? And they spoke Malay. What's so difficult to understand about that? That's really strange. But that's, that's the kind of, I wanted to give you, okay, when we talk about Melayu, Singap Singapore, what does that mean? Right? Later on, we'll talk about it a little bit more, but this is a kind of intro crash, intro not, not even crash, I don't know what it was. But I want us to kind of rethink what we assume when we say all these cultural frames, right? Malay or Orang Laut or whatever. Um, the, another, pre another point I want to make, uh, and this is part two, is the prelude to the long 18th century, that means before 1699. I already mentioned century as a temporal framework to be a little bit problematic, and uh, therefore even 1699, which is close to 1700, is not quite a good way to introduce the 18th century. We need to know what happened leading up to the 18th century. And uh, one of the, there are many things to be said, of course. I want to focus on just this point. Dutch Malacca's major decline in trade and Johor's prosperity and popularity. And why do I talk about this? Because I want to break this myth that without the white man, there would have been no trade. And nobody else would have come to South Asia because who wants to be under a brown man's rule? And who wants to do trade under brown man's rule? Only white men can administer us. Right? You say this in Thailand, they will laugh their heads off. We were never under any colony. We are fine. We have BTS. We have airports, Warna Bumi. We didn't need white men. Well, they did, like, actually, as engineers, uh, as consultants, and so on. So technology transfer, of course. But you know what? What would you say about the fact that our watches today use Hindu Arabic numerals? Isn't that technology transfer? The decimal system. And uh, why aren't we using Roman numerals? Why are we using Chinese paper and so on? So please, again, essentializing things is no use, right? 
Yes, technology is transferred from the West, but the West also gained a lot from elsewhere. So please don't give me this kind of uh, di discussion. But the point is that in the lead up to the 18th century, actually, nobody wanted to visit Dutch Malacca unless they were allies like Sia. Sia were enemies of uh, Johor Riau. And so they were always chummies with Dutch Malacca. There was one point I will show you later, they had a problem though, because Dutch Malacca was really in the doldrums, they couldn't even get money in payment for their tin. Johor, on the other hand, let's go and take a look. The Dutch, of course, I just came back from the Netherlands, so I'm glad I just came back because I can't say this there. Or maybe I can. They're quite chill about it, but not quite. Um, many of them still don't talk about the colonial past enough. And they don't like to say, for example, that their golden age was born on the backs in a, to a large extent. Not solely, I'm saying not solely, but to a large extent on the exploitation they had from Java and the Spice Islands, such as the, Amboina mass the Ambon Massacre. I'm sure you've heard about this how they forced everything into there. So this kind of aggression is very much a characteristic of how the Dutch operated in Malay and Javanese waters. Very much so. And you know, I mean, this is something we don't talk about in Singapore because we say, ah, you know, never mind. That's their colonial experience. Our colonial experience is very benign. We never went through this, so we don't have to bother. Oh, I, when I hear this, my ears go red. Yeah, so let's go through this. I mean, General Jan Peterson Kuhn, actually said we cannot carry on trade with our war. It's a, it's a, basically, it's gunboat trade diplomacy, if you can call it diplomacy at all. Right? And so, for example, there are so many incidents, you'll be tired of it. Every decade, there'll be one. But in 1647, there were Dutch blockades of major Malay ports to exclude Indian traders, out of many different, like, exclude this guy, exclude that guy, please exclude this one, exclude, exclude, exclude. In 1667, the Dutch went to Makassar, and this caused the Bugis dispersal we know of. And when we say Bugis, actually we mean Wajo, Wajo merchants, right? And, uh, and for example, John Crawford speaks glowingly of the Wajo merchants, Wajo Bugis merchants. Don't confuse Wajo with Bajau, completely different. Yeah? But in 1647, the Dutch were uh, blockading Malay ports to tell them, don't let the Indians trade. We, they should all come to Dutch Malacca, and better yet, Dutch Batavia. They can't go to your ports. Can you believe they have that right? And then things like Malacca governor saying, you know, the fruits of Malacca can only be properly enjoyed if all these people are driven from the sea forever. Let's tomorrow go take a bus to Malacca and enjoy Dutch colonial architecture. Yeah? Enjoy it, right? Wow, you know, the Dutch, thank goodness, we have stone buildings because of them. Otherwise, we would have had no progress, no money. That's what we still do. We aestheticize the colonial past. Now, but despite all of this glowing bravado, and the fact that the Dutch did have good gunpowder, they still declined. So 1656, and this is not mentioned in Singapore 700 years. They make it sound like it's all a colonial story. Did the Dutch or the Portuguese, you know, gain the upper hand? How about the Malays? Ah, sorry, we, we're not talking about them. We're talking about them as royal you know, rulers, right? Their, their politics of intrigue, who they wanted to marry, who got offended. Yeah. <laughs> not about them as business managers and port rulers. But actually, if you really read the sources, Dutch Malacca was in decline in the 17th century. Dutch Malacca Strait was as in Nether, if you listen to Andaya, that chapter I mentioned earlier. And then, the, 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 the Dutch leader, if you like, of Dutch Malacca, 1662 was given just the title of commander, not governor, to reflect the decline in trade, for example. There are many other instances, right? And so if you look at this um, report by Governor Vosburg on Chinese junks in 1696, just, a, just an example, he noted only one had come to Dutch Malacca, whereas Johor played host to as many as 11. How come they pay? You mean the Chinese preferred the brown man huh, to the white man? Huh? Got like that one, man? I thought it was, must go to white man. Who wants to go to corrupt, despotic, brown man regime and trade there, show kena tipu, right? That's how we think, right? Like God, the, yeah. well, actually, if you really looked at the past, it wasn't like that. It was not like that. Now, coming back to Singapore, though, where did Singapore play in all this? According to this map, it was next to Malacca. And opposite is the enemy of the Portuguese. Malacca, of course, at the time was Portuguese, huh? 1608. Aceh, they were, you remember the tri triangular warfare? So here, because uh, Johor is left out of the picture, Singapore kind of stands in lieu of. Yeah? There is this notion that Singapore still played a major role. 
if you, if you look at the 1678 map, at the back of it, there is a text. At the back of this map, it says Malacca, denominated for its emporium or city of greater strait, belongs to the Portuguese who have also Singapura and Pulau Sembilan. Where is Pulau Sembilan? Today, all amalgamated into Jurong Island. Now, there's a lot more to this that we don't know about. Why does he refer to Malacca? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, why does he refer to Singapore and Pulau Sembilan as being under the Portuguese in Malacca? There's something more to it, right? In the uh, late 17th century. So this is before our period, 18th century. This Singapura seems to be amalgamated to the peninsula, a bit inaccurate, but the point is that it was a location at the southern end next to Mua and Malacca. So if you were sailing according to this itinerary, Malacca, Mua, and Mua significance I will later on be able to talk about as well. And that's Johor right there, Johor. Johor. So they put a kind of I right in the game. Um, so a little bit there about just the point about Singapore's position within this uh, network of trade, uh, or rather alliances, but also the point that it's not at all about colonial success or failure. You know, we cannot be talking about the, the history of trade in the region without also looking at the Malays. Now we go, now we come to the 18th century itself and look at Singapore's position within the Johor Real Polities timeline. I said I'll start with 1699. I'm sure many of you have heard this many, many times, I think. That's why you're here. I mean, you're all like fans of history, you know, otherwise you wouldn't trudge your way up the hill. But yeah, at this hour, some of right? So the regicide of Sultan Mahmud at Kota Tinggi, as I mentioned, was this major cataclysmic event as far as the Malays of the Straits, particularly the, Orang, the Rakyat Singapura on Singapore Island was concerned. Now the regicide, is interestingly enough, and my mom's side is from Bentan, so we we were told that we inherited the curse, the seven generation curse. Although by my time, obviously the curse has expired. And so there was one time, I'm um, just an insert, one personal anecdote. My aunts on my maternal side were in a van going to Kota Tinggi. They wanted to go to the waterfall. That's why everybody goes to Kota Tinggi apparently, the waterfall. <laughs> they forgot about the curse because they were the younger generation, except one elderly member who was in the van. And then they told me, I wasn't there, that the van started swerving left and right. And then they were like, what's going on? And then everybody felt giddy. And then the ultimate uh, it point that took place was the back door of the van flipped open. There and then, the eldest uh, member told them, actually, you know, maybe, after all, the curse is true. Maybe we should really not go. What curse? And then she told them the story. Uh, yeah, and then they were saying, oh, maybe we are no longer seven descendants because, uh, past seven descendants, because by right, you're supposed to mutadara, vomit blood. Anyway, so there is this seven generation curse myth. Whether you believe it or not, it's up to you. Right? But the regicide was carried out by the Laksmana based at Bentan. If you know the Sulalatu Salatin, you attended the 15th century lecture, perhaps you know that in the Malay kind of cultural geography, Bentan and Singapura are the alternative sites of naval power. Held to be of great antiquity. Right? The Queen of Bentan, you remember that. Right? He gave the Nobat to uh, the uh, installation uh, orchestra to. Uh, Sri Tribuana, for example. So, Laksmana Magat Sri Rama of Bentan was the one who finally did the, uh, committed the deed. Nobody else wanted to do it. And it was significant because if the king is Rama, this is of course Hindu myth, Laksmana is his brother, right? The naval force. What more can you say when the Laksmana does this? It's very poetic. You don't find this in Indian uh, uh, kind of uh, political taxonomy. It's the Malays who appropriated this Rama and Laksmana brother pair. Only the Malays use the Laksmana uh, term, right? So it's an appropriation. You, don't, you, you try, you won't find it in India. But it's from India, the idea. Um, Bandahara line assumed the throne, but they were perceived to no longer possess the mantle of Bukit Seguntang line. So what happened? Where do you put your capital, right? I mean, you're compromised. So the Bandahara line eventually decided to move to Riau by 1709. Because not Singapore, how can they come to Singapore? Singapore was the base of the riot, Singapura. And it was the Bentan uh, Laksmana who committed the regicide, so good place to go, Bentan. But not at Bentan, so if you look at some of the old maps later, Bentan Island, which is shaped like a prawn or like a cashew nut, is perceived to have two halves. The northern half is seen as Bentan, the southern half is seen as Riau. So they moved to the southern half. Um, the Temenggong line, um, I'm just giving you a rundown, uh, mentioned Laksmana, so Bandahara and Temenggong, these are the main functionaries of the state. He held the fief of Johor and Singapore and Karimun. And that this would be um, 
one point of entry for the British later when we look at the events of 1890. Right? And today, they are the present-day rulers of modern Johor. Yeah? The Bandahara line has faced a demise. They are actually living in Singapore. They moved. When the Dutch declared the Sultanate abolished in 1911, they moved to Singapore. They moved to Singapore. Anyway, that's just a rundown. But so the situation now is, OK, we've, the, the, there's no more Malay kingship in the line of, actually, Perak still has. So Perak is still in the line of the Malacca rulers, the Perak Sultan today. Okay, so I mean, but that's going beyond point. Um, well, again, you know, I, I already had the prelude uh, stated the fact that the Dutch in Malacca were uh, hand, uh, mishandling everything in terms of trade. They were not able to compete with Johor. They couldn't match the prices offered by the English country traders who resorted to Johor. 1705, not yet 1709, right? 1709, they shifted to Riau. And the same thing happened, right? So now, Andaya tells us, it is linked to the Bugis commercial network, which was second only to that of the Indians. Remember, the Indians were told, we need to drive them out, all of the Indians. From the, then we can conduct our trade here. Drive all the bloody Indians out, right? And then now the Bugis, yeah? Well, worse still, the Indians didn't operate trade ports. Now the Bugis is trade, operating one in Riau. Wow, what consternation, yeah? OK, so that's the context, just next door. Right, the capital shifted. Now, when the capital was at Johor, Singapore was the Shah Bandar or Port Masters station. Now, with the regicide and with the fact that the new, the new ruler was something that the Singapore, Singapura Rakyat did not pay allegiance to, what do you think happened? Yeah? What do you think happened? So now, moving to Riau or Bentan meant that you no longer had to have an offshore Shah Bandar or Port Master location. You are already offshore. What are you talking about? You are already offshore. Yeah? I mean, it kind of, um, this is kind of looking at it from the geopolitical uh, strategic location perspective. However, when there was a contender, and actually there's a long story here if you read the Hikayat Sia. Um, Hikayat Sia claims that, and many of you might be familiar with this already, claims that there was indeed actually an heir to Sultan Mahmud uh, when he died without, uh, when he died uh, by regicide in 1699 and that this heir um, was the daughter, uh, was, sorry, was the son of Encik Pong. Encik Pong is the daughter of the Laksmana. The Laksmana based, uh, Laksmana and uh, the fact that this, this son was later brought up in, uh, under the uh, care of Temenggong Mua. So it's a very complicated story, up to the age of seven, and then he was brought to Pagaruyong and taken care of there, and then finally, it was the uh, people of Singapore who accompanied him to Johor. Right now. So this is a very complicated story. And then you have the Bugis version of these same stories, which we will come back to. But if, if you look at 1718, so two events from the 18th century, you, it tells us that actually Singapore was still of great significance if you were trying to get at the jugular vein of the Johor polity. Right? And so the contender, Raja of Siak, the one I mentioned, who says that he is the successor, the rightful successor to the throne. And he decides to contact Singapore's Rajanagara Salat. So Singapore, he tells us that in the 18th century, Singapore had an organized society under an acknowledged ruler, going by the designation Raja. Now, in Malay, after Islamization, Raja meant chief. It's Sultan that means king, so don't make the mistake. So Raja yeah, is, is the chief. Raja Negara Selat. Negara Selat meaning the country of the straits. So Singapore had the Raja Negara Selat. And so, Raja Kecik contacts. If you listen to Hikayat Siak though, it says that it was the reverse. It was Singapore's Raja Negara Selat who goes to Bengkalis, which is at the mouth of the Siak River, to pledge allegiance to the campaign that uh, Raja Kecik of Siak wants to enact to conquer Johor, his rightful throne. What is it? I mean, this is... Now, this whole thing in yellow is omitted from the second edition of the 700 years. It bypasses the fact that Singapore had a role, it had people, it had a leader. And depending on which source, either you listen to Tuhfat al-Nafis, which is the Bugis perspective, or the Bugis Pranakan perspective, or if you listen to Hikayat Siak, it's either or. Either the contender to the throne came to Singapore, or, according to Hikayat Siak, no, 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 they came to us to pledge allegiance. And together, they went to attack and were successful. So the following year, they got 
what they wanted. Yeah? So they replaced this Bandahara line, the chief minister line, with somebody who is seen as the rightful heir, who comes from the Malacca Bukit Seguntan line. With the support of Singapore, it is not in the 700 year book. Yeah? It's left out. So it's crucial. Yeah? Singapore is not Terra Nullis. No, everybody keeps asking, it's 18th century, maybe we were depopulated. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, then Raja Nagara Salat ruled over nothing, and then, you know, why, why, why did he pledge allegiance, right? So it was not empty for sure. I mean, there's a lot um, to be also said by looking at this map. Yeah? Um, so, of course, to recover the throne, uh, the, um, well, when I say Malay Sultan Sulaiman, it means the Bandahara line, right? Uh, wanted to regain the throne from Raja Kecil of Sia, and so he enlisted Bugis support. And um, later on, we find that Sultan Sulaiman's palace in Riau is indicated, for example, in this map with Negeri Riau, and that's the bazaar. So, the capital is here after 1709, right? So it was reinstated. Um, and what I want to point out is, on this map, actually, you look at how prominent Singapore is, despite the fact that the settlement is here. So, I mean, Peter Boschberg would tell us this has to do a lot with the old and new straits, eh? the old, old strat and the new strat of Singapore, uh, on the Langen, Langen Island, uh, the Long Island. Pulau Panjang, because if you're sailing past, it's this long, stretched out island as opposed to Batam and Bintan, which doesn't stretch out in the direction of sailing. That's an evocative name. But my point is, just look at how prominent Singapore is, despite the fact that the capital was here. Yeah, not here, obviously. A close-up, that's Negori Riau. So this is a short form. The Dutch were so familiar with this adopted Malay term, Negri, that they would just write N-Y, Negri. You'll find it on numerous Dutch maps. They adopted this term as well as other terms like Kampung or Urban Ward. So Negri Riau right there and the Bazaar. So that's the kind of like administrative capital and the port. Right? And that's Singapore then, the East Coast. Okay, a whole body of text and it's in Malay, which is deliberate, because then I'll have to translate it for you. Um, but many of you can read Malay, so what is this telling us? It's telling us one more thing, and that is. The basis for, you know, everybody talks about with great surprise that, oh, you know, actually in 1819, there were 20 Teochew Gambia planters that the British didn't know about. You know, they miraculously appeared like mushrooms on Singapore. <laughs> no, they were part of the continuity of Riau's Gambia plantation economy. And the Temenggong continued that policy on Singapore. He moved here in 1818 and initiated that economic role, uh, I'm sorry, economic uh, framework. Right? And uh, actually, they didn't just plant Gambia, they also planted uh, pepper, lada hitam. On the, and it was said that the benih, the seed, the Gambia seeds were taken from Pulau Percha, which is the Malay term for Sumatra, Pulau Percha. So they brought it, and then they started, this was an economic initiative to boost Riau's position. So not only was it an entrepot, it also had its own now valuable produce. Gambia, which was in demand at that time. And so you can read the rest, but then it says, you know, uh, so it's not just a Bugis and Malay thing, but also the Javanese were part of the trade, and then uh, it mentioned that um, at that time, initially, the, the plantations were under Bugis and Malay ownership, and then they brought direct from China. This is important. China, China yang datang dari negeri China. Not the Chinese Pranakans from the region, but Chinese from China, Teochews. So there was a distinction. I know it sounds funny to say, why do you have to mention China, China yang datang dari negeri China? Because you're differentiating that these are not Chinese from the region. These are new imports for labor yeah, in, the, in, the, uh, in the plantations. Um, and uh, this is a rare map. This is showing Riau, and then it differentiates Riau from Bintan. So it says things, that's Tanjung Pinang. Just to give you an orientation, this is Pulau Penyengat. It's written in a funny spelling, but it's saying Penyengat, Pulau Penyengat. So this is Tanjung Pinang, and that's the river. Now, this is the old river, Sungai Riau Lama, leading to Bintan. Bintan is up there. Temple, they always call it temple, and they draw the moss there. The Konings Dalem, the palace, the ruler's palace, the Pasar, Kampung Bintan, because some Bintan folks came down and settled here, so that's their Kampung, but this is Riau. And a close up. This is funny. I think it says Sungai Soflit. Soflit, uh, Soflit means so many. So many because there's so many rivers. And then marshy grounds, Sungai Putri, Sungai Galang, and so on. Right? 
So I'm kind of repeating some of this. And I can't make this out, so you know, it is still something I'm working on. Because I'm looking at this and comparing it to other maps of uh, riverine port cities such as Palembang. Right? The, the structure is always the same. These waterfront um, settlements that had tiny rivers that, that segmented the, uh, the, the settlements. And they were each regarded as separate wards under different jurisdictions. So it was a form of urban governance that responded to the topography. But maybe I shouldn't belabor on that. We move on. Um, and this was also the period where the Dutch Bugis trade revel re really reached boiling point. It really reached reached the boiling point. And of course, they could capitalize on the fact that the Malays and Bugis were also in enmity. Yeah? So, for example, in 1746, two years before that huge cataclysmic event that uh, befell Riau, uh, the Dutch concluded two anti-Bugis trade treaties with Malay port rulers, with Johor and Perak. Remember, these two are the ones with some link to Malacca royal line. So it's all about tin. Tin, if the Bugis were driven out, that's very explicit, right? Against the Selangor Bugis. And then this happened. One of the first uh, signs of aggression, the Bugis siege of Dutch Malacca because of this, in retaliation. And they almost won had it not been for the fact that Batavia came to their aid. So then, in the aftermath of this disaster, or near disaster, the next Dutch, sorry, the next Dutch governor decided, okay, we're not going to get involved, we're not going to help any Malay states, we know whatever war, we refuse to supply any ammunition to anybody. And so when the Sultan of Kedah requested, he was turned down, he decided to, that this is the beginning of the Kedah turn to the English against the Bugis, among other things, because they were also against the Siamese uh, incursion. It's, it's a very complicated, so I'm glossing over a lot of things here. Um, but, I mean, eventually this, of course, as I said, yeah, allowed this event to happen, the founding of Penang, because of this turn to the English. Now, the second event, 50 years later, after the earlier um, Siak contender to the throne appeared, you have uh, the nephew of Raja Kecik, which is Raja Ismail, trying again. Uh, according to the Tuhfat Anafis, he imposed himself upon Rakyat Singapura, this is the specific term used, to build him ships and boats, and led the assault at Tanah Merah. He retreated to Tanah Merah and so on. But again, you know, across the 18th century, Singapore was known to be the place you could rely on to put together uh, an armed uh, force. And then, in 1769, Francis Light was active in the region as a country trader. Well, he was active in this period, and he, in a written statement, in, in one of his accounts, calls Riau, rather than Malacca, Dutch Malacca, the key to the Straits. Again, yeah, not Dutch Malacca, but Bugis and Malay administered Riau. For Francis Light, a British country trader, the key to the Straits. Just let this sink in. We don't talk about this. We keep talking about what white men did, as though the Malays did nothing but fish, and the Bugis did nothing but piracy. Please, can we stop this kind of frame? It's such an insult to people like me. Yeah, it is. I want to make it clear. The, hu the way we handle our history is such an insult. It's such an insult, and we are so neo-colonial. We need to move beyond these colonial frames, once and for all. And if there's any way to do this, it should be with the Singapore Bicentennial when we finally mature and truly want to look at our history in the region and for whatever, 700 years, you want 1,400, do it. Whatever, it doesn't matter, right? But you really, really need to reframe your perspective on history, not to be so Eurocentric. The Englishman himself says it. Okay, so, so I have to rely on a white man la, to legitimize the statement, right? If a Malay says, Ria was the light of the streets, you're like, yeah, of course, la, you Malayu, you will say that, what? But no, this is a British country trader. He would have no, nothing to gain from saying Ria was the light, the key to the streets, right? So, fortunately, white man wrote and recorded. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Francis Light, right? <laughs> now, the cataclysmic event, right? The destruction of Riau. The Dutch in Batavia intensified their diversion of Chinese trade from peninsula to Batavia, and this antagonized the young Ton Muda of Riau, Raja Haji. And then the governor in Malacca refused. So all these antagonisms, huh? so it got him all riled up. All riled up. Now, Riau at that time was at the height of its trading prosperity. So all these insults were an annoyance. 
Yeah. And so, when the governor in Malacca told Raja Haji, don't let the English into Riau or any other of your boogie spots. All you boogies, don't allow the English. Treat them as your enemy. What did he reply? He said, now you can look at, you can compare this to the reply of Sultan Hassanuddin of Makassar when the Dutch told them in 1667 not to allow the Gujarati and Portuguese to trade there and to stop trading to the Spice Islands. Can you imagine? The Dutch going to Makassar, the home base of the Wajok Bugis traders, telling them, hey you, I want you from now onwards to regard the Gujarati and the Portuguese as your enemy. Don't allow them in your port, only us. And secondly, could you please stop trading to the Spice Islands? We will have the monopoly for that. Thank you very much. How would you respond? Why don't you Google it? You can find it online. What did Sultan Hassanuddin reply? And you compare it to this reply. He says, I shall remain in the middle or neutral between the company, the, the Dutch East India Company, BOC, and the English, since my friend, the Dutch, and the English are equally strong and powerful, and I therefore cannot join with either one or the other side. If my friend is afraid of the English and trembles before them, what can we, the weak and powerless people, do? So are you, are you thinking, are you feeling here as a Singaporean or are you feeling as people in this region? I want to know. <laughs> I want to know. Or are you saying, oh no, no, we should side with, who should we side with? Uh? In Singapore, this is not our story. I don't know. We are part of this polity. Uh. We are part of this polity. And so the war happened. I mean, this is very long, but this is a very good account by Andaya. Andaya has a way of writing, which I really like. So it says the war was the logical outcome of the arrival of the Bugis, they had been threatening uh, for many years, um, and so on. But the point is that they, 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 the Dutch did not manage to subdue Riau, actually. They did not. They failed. They failed. And so they limped home, he says. You know, he said limped home. I, that's why I quoted extensively from Andaya. He phrases it in such a sexy way. So he says, no sooner had the humiliated Dutch fleet limped home, actually should be no idea, never mind. Then the Bugis replied by an attack on Malacca, an attack which proved to be a governor's nightmare. So for five months, he was besieged. And again, you know, the Sia against Sia is the best friends, friend, best friends with the Dutch because they were in enmity with Johor. Um, and so the only reason the, uh, the Bugis lost was Raja Haji was killed by a Dutch bullet. You know why? It doesn't explain. Because Andaya assumes, uh, Leonard Andaya assumes we all know. What do you think was such a big blow? The Bugis and the Malays believed in what is called Kabal. Ta'lut Pluru. That means you won't be penetrated by the... You won't be killed by a bullet. Or by the sword, for that matter. So when this happened, they were like, oh, very demoralizing. Yeah, and so they left. Now when they left, oh, that was the golden opportunity. They left in this array. And so, so Riau and Selangor were captured by the Bugis. And that was the end of it. In fact, if you read the uh, account, uh, by, uh, sorry, there is a point here I wanted to make. Uh, well, it's a minor point, but the Malays of Duyong is interesting because Duyong in uh, Malacca is said to be the settlement associated with Lakmana Hang Tua. Now, whether you believe it or not, it's a separate matter, but it's quite interesting that it was Duyong who defected, so they supported the attack of the Bugis. And in Singapore, Kampung Glam's original Orang Selat name was Duyong. So it's the Malays who call it Kampung Glam because it's Orang Glam territory. So anyway, it's just a trivia. I'm not sure why I put it there, never mind. So um, in the aftermath of Riau's destruction, you read this account, very painful account by the Tufat al-Nafis. He says, I mean, how do I want to translate this? It's beautiful in Malay. Maka berpecah belahlah segala anak-anak raja dan orang baik-baik dan orang kaya-kaya dan orang kebanyakan membawa dirinya masing-masing haluannya. Dan tiadalah yang tinggal lagi di dalam negeri Riau melainkan Cina-Cina yang di dalam hutan sahaja yang tinggal yang mengambil kuli-kuli dengan orang-orang Melayu dan kepada orang-orang Bugis yang berkebun-kebun gambir dan lada hitam. Now, the translation to that is completely dispersed were the whole denizens of Riau. Absolutely. All the good people and all the traders and the nobility and the common people, they all dispersed all sorts of places. Nobody remained in Riau except the Chinese who lived in the what they call hutan, meaning the, the plantations who were the coolies to the Malays and the Bugis, who had all these plantations of Gambia and pepper. And then this explanation. Adapun Cina-Cina yang jadi kuli itu, demikianlah mula-mulanya sebab kerana itulah banyak Cina-Cina yang tinggal. Tiada pindah ke sana kemari. Now, this is the origin, the account says, of why the Chinese coolies from uh, Hua Tio Chiu um, began to be there, did not move anywhere else. So, if you read Troki's account, by the time the Malays and Bugis came back, 
the Teochews had taken over all the plantations, and it remains uh, remained like that into the 19th century. So it was a shahadan rosaklah negeri Riau. How do I translate that? Riau lay in ruins, yeah, and so on. So, but and and then it was not enough because Van Bram wanted to come and like flush out whoever remained. You know, it was like total flush. In other words, really just destroy Riau once and for all. Nothing. This is just like what Jan Peterson Kuhn had said, right? Get rid of them once and for all. That's the Dutch for you, huh? Such liberal people. Yeah, and, and then we are so proud of the fact that they came out with this uh, what document on um, Ma, what was it? I forget. The, 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 the free law of the seas. Free for whom? Free for whom? So the Teochew Chinese are real reason with Van Bram. Don't go and flush everything out. I like this phrasing because it was in Chinese accented Malay. If you read it, if you know. Ini sekarang terlalu susah nanti jika lau company Hollanda pergi ikut lagi raja-raja Melayu itu di mana-mana ia diam. Nanti susah benar lagi, 10 tahun pun tiara boleh habis. Jika lau company Hollanda menang pun berpuluh-puluh buah negeri Melayu yang rosak. Apalagi di dalam laut semuanya orang kulit hitam sudah jadi perompak semuanya. Kita semua orang Cina-Cina pun tiara boleh duduk gila, diam di dalam uh, Riau lagi. Apa orang Cina mau makan ke laut pun? Tak boleh lagi takutkan perompak. Maka di alam Riau ini, di dalam Riau ini semua makanan dari luar semuanya. I say, you know. So what is it saying actually? It's saying you, you shouldn't do this because if you did this, dozens of Malay negeries would be ruined. What more in the seas? All the now the first now. If you read Virginia Matheson, she notes this is the first time the word orang kulit hitam appears in a Malay account. It says the dark skin, us dark skin people, have all become perompak, robbers, because we've lost everything. Right? Now, when you talk about robbery or piracy, it has to do with a retaliation, right? Because you've taken away what is rightfully yours. You've been it's been taken away from you. Well, anyway, that is the account by the, uh, by the Tufat al Nafi. So then Van Bram, according to his account, stopped chasing the Bugis and um, Bugis Pranakan and Melayu away. Now, that was 1784. Two years later, Speed Forward Penang founded as a, by the same person we saw earlier, Francis Light, the British country trader. And so on, right? So now 1811, I'm, I'm pushing forward. Sultan Mahmud, because this is already going into the 19th century, but I argue we have to look at it as part of the long 18th century, Sultan Mahmud. So the second event dealing with the death of a monarch, the first one was 1699. Now in 1811, Sultan Mahmud Shah uh, of Riau dies with no heir appointed. Crisis. As though, you know, Malay has, Malays are saying, right? Sudah jatuh tertimpa tangga. You fell and the ladder fell on top of you some more. Hmm? And you know this story, so I won't belabor it. Now, okay, that was my historical timeline. Now we come to Singapore, okay. Now, 1811 was where uh, I go back to the 1670, 16, 1767 Singapore building uh, episode. So this is the full account in the Tufat al-Nafis. It's a very complicated. You see people from Terengganu to Riau, Pahang, Tambelan. Tambelan is in the Natuna Islands. Pulau Yang Tujo, which is again the Natuna and uh, Anambas. Uh, so they, they, the, 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 the Raja Ismail forces used two sources for the naval power. They went to Pulau Yang Tujo, uh, Tambelan and uh, Anambas Islands. And then they came to Singapore. Berlayarlah ke Singapura, maka rakyat Singapura pun diperintahnya lah dengan kerasnya. So he commanded them with harshness and he forced them to go to his side, sebelah dia, menyebelah dia. Serta disuruh menyiapkan, so he asked them, please prepare, you know, prepare for me all your boats and, uh, ships and boats. And then Tanah Merah, so he keeps mentioning uh, that he retreated to Tanah Merah. So Tanah Merah was his base. Yeah? So definitely not empty, and that's Tanah Merah. Not even talking about Singapore River. Um, so I'm talking about, uh, 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 this is a parallel development, just so you know that even though uh, Riau had been ruined, there were still further building projects. So in 1804, so there were a number of major construction projects uh, enacted in Riau, but the trade had never recovered to the same extent. Yeah? Um, and then the Teochews by then had a culture. So they live, if you go to Sengarang today, that's the Teochew settlement. Okay? A lot of the buildings are aquatic on water. Um, and then you also have Tanjung Pinang. Mostly it's Hokkien, shopkeepers, but they also built on water. Tanjung Pinang. All those houses on water are chi Chinese, either Teochew or Hokkien. Teochew on Sengarang, Hokkien on Tanjung Pinang. So the real Chinese are within two generations. 
they, they, they completely change their mode of living even. Yeah? And I'm just using that example. So this happened just before. I mean, this is the aftermath of that, that destruction. And so I mentioned this already. But there was also an account saying that by 1811, there was some revival of trade from the Bugis perspective. Right? And um, now, there's this figure named Anku Kareng Taliba whose relative arrives, and then because of a dispute over the uh, work and the administration of the Chinese, they quarrel. And so because of the quarrel they were uh, with somebody else, Raja Idris, uh, also Bugis. Now, this is Bugis Pranakan. This is Bugis Toto. That means arrive direct. So they're, they're different faction. Huh? The direct arrival Bugis, Karang. In fact, actually Karang should be, well, anyway. Let's not go into that. But Karang, uh, as opposed to Raja, Raja is the title assumed by Bugis Pranakan in Riau. Yeah? So they had a dispute, and well, it's a complicated story, but what happens in the end is Karang Chandapuli decide to pull out of this issue in Riau, and nobody, it's not mentioned where he headed off to, but we next find him as the owner of the land at Kampung Rochor, at Java Road, where Haja Fatima Mosque is today. He is the husband of Haja Fatima. Mm -hmm. But by about 1840, he seems to have passed away. And then we hear references to the widow, Haja Fatima, whose wife, uh, who is the wife of Karen Chandrapuli and so on. Right? So if you look at the genealogy of the family, they mentioned. So Chandrapuli, at some point between 1819 and 1818, relocated to Singapore, just like Tamangong relocated to Singapore in 1818. So if we move forward. So here is uh, Troki, this one. Uh, the new, second edition, that's why it says 2007 saying that the, in the end, the uh, Riau, uh, or, or rather the Bugis, uh, Yam Tuan Muda, Raja Jaffa in Riau, allowed the Dutch to reoccupy Riau. And uh, this was a blow to the Temenggong, who then went to Singapore. That was 1819. So when he came to Singapore, he continued the economic activity that Riau was known for. And that's why the British discovered that there were, at the first instance of their discovery, they realized there were 20 Teochew Gambia planters. They did not know about that earlier. Right? So they had been there even before Raffles' arrival. But it wasn't just the Teochew Gambia planters and not just those 20, there were many more. Right? On the East Coast, there were many. Later on, the British also discovered there were Javanese, Bugis planters yeah. plant with plantations. So it was not something the British had noticed at the first instance. And I wanted to quote at length uh, what Troki says. Uh, the scene of our story now shifts to Singapore. We're, and we must consider the question of relations between the Malays and the British. Riau, now under the Dutch, continued as a port and seat, seat of Malay power. But from 1819, it had a very strong rival, quickly outstripped. Singapore took over all the functions that Riau had once performed. And I knew Troki was writing this in the 1970s first. It was a center for the Indian open trade, and it drew native and Chinese trade. It also became center for Gambia. With the anthropoid in foreign hands, the ecological niche that the Sultanate had once occupied was destroyed. And so now when you come to Singapore, you notice a lot of things relocated to Singapore. If you go to this map, which is the 1820 Butte map in the 700 years second edition, you will find that this part of the map is cropped out, unfortunately. This part of the map shows Bugis town extending to the Eastern Bay in front of the Sultan's Palace. That would complete the picture. That would complete the picture. The Bugis were in Singapore in great numbers too. And then this map, if you looked at the edition published in the, eight, the Singapore 700 years book, the map crops it here. So you see the word Bugis, but you don't know Bugis what. It's Bugis town. And there is not only a Bugis town, but a Bugis village. And then the Raja Wan village, what, we don't know what that means. And then, uh, and so on. So what's interesting is there's Bugis Town, Bugis Village, Kampung Glam, right? Old lines of Singapore, the, the old Malay lines in another map. Now, and it says Kampung China right here. So there's the use of the term Kampong to mean urban ward, but then you have Bugis Town. What does that imply? It seems to me to imply that there was a very major settlement of Bugis in Singapore by 1825, for which the term town was applied. As opposed to the gen general term, which had gone into general use on all colonial maps already by this time, which is kampung. Kampung is understood as not village, huh? it's really urban ward, so it's urban. But then why do you use town? Uh -huh, interesting, eh? Bugis town, it says. 
So, but Bugis town was asked to relocate because the area was very prime and so it had to be given to the prime people, uh, Europeans. So today, if you go to Middle Road, that area with all the broad streets and, you know, it's the only area where you see a clear grid of streets, right? Very broad, nice plain. Uh, that was originally Bugis town. Bugis Junction is therefore correct. Mm, in a way, and Bugis MRT station, the only thing that reminds us of this connection, right? I'm still, I mean, today when the Bugis come to, I mean, people from Indonesia come to Singapore, hey, got other Bugis here in Singapore? <laughs> they will say this, hey, how come got Bugis in Singapore? Because we are so removed from this history. I mean, this is just a, well, the thing is, this map from uh, 1820 is special because it actually calls the, the settlement at the mouth of the Singapore River, Singapore Town. And Palace is also clearly demarcated as a Temenggong settlement. His center for administration of the Gambia and uh, coconut plantation. So in Singapore, coconut plantation became a thing. So Gilang Serai was originally called Gilang Kelapa. And the interesting thing is the Al Sagoff family who inherited that land after their marriage into uh, Haja Fatima's inheritance. Uh, Haja Fatima had only a daughter, Raja Siti. So she was called Raja because her father is Kareng Chandapuli. Right? So it's interestingly, instead of she assumed the Bugis Pranakan title Raja, Raja Siti. So Raja Siti uh, was married to an Al Sagoff. So the Al Sagoff inherited all the wealth of the Karang Chandapuli and Haja Fatima. All the Bugis wealth went into the Al Sagoff family. Yeah. And um, in the Al Sagoff family tradition, they recall that originally Gelang Serai lands, which they owned up to the 1970s, the Al Sagoffs. Huh? You can read this out very easily. It's all over the uh, Singapore newspapers. In the 1970s, the government courted, uh, courted with the Al Sagoffs to sell off the land for development. So anyway, the Al Sago family remembers in their family tradition that Haja Fatima was the original owner of what was originally called Gelang Kelapa, coconut plantation. But as somebody once contested, there are no British records to prove it. My answer to that was between 1819 and 1824, the rest of the island was not under the British yet. It was not. And we do not know what attrition happened when the transfer of sovereignty across all these lands, including the Teochew Chukangs. We don't know what attrition happened. Who would have taken care of all this? Who would have taken care of all this? One more trivia that is rather interesting. The oldest suburban, in fact, you can call it Ulu, because it indeed is Ulu location. The, the only early suburban, uh, the oldest suburban uh, Teochew, tem uh, uh, Teochew Catholic temple, for that matter, actually, uh, in Singapore is at, does anybody know? Aukang lah, if it's Teochew, where else? Aukang, right? Yeah. Which is the Aukang old Teochew temple? Uh, 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 sorry, Catholic church? The church of the nativity of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Now, who donated the statue? But that's only in 1947. The Sultan of Johor. Now, the church account is that he was close to the father, but I believe it also now, this continuing patronage between the Sultan of Johor and all the former Chukangs of the Teochews, including the Chukang up at Aukang. Yeah. Well, that's, that's something to ponder about. Not that I have firm hard evidence, but that continuing connection is rather intriguing. Yeah, rather intriguing. But anyway, so this is coming back to this. You have the extract of a letter on, now G.D. Coleman, you know, he, it's quite a pity what happened to him. He was asked to do some surveys and then he was dismissed. It says uh, in an, another letter in 1829, after he had done some surveys uh, uh, in 1829, he had actually been dismissed, you know. Uh, uh, or rather, he was deemed to be no longer necessary. But he continued a lot of surveys in 1829, which was later published. So he came up with a series of maps which used the Malayo Islamic term Mukim. We inherit this to this day. When we talk about divisions of land in Singapore, we do not use some English topographical terminology for which there would have existed, I mean, cadastral surveys, how much more English can you get? We use the term Mukim. What does that tell us? I can't, can't give you the answer, but it implies that outside of town, between 18 and, yeah, there, there was already a division, which the British had to somehow follow anyway. Yeah? And so Mukim, we inherit it to this day, Mukim. Yeah? And so when um, Coleman did his surveys in 1829, just a mere five years after the transfer of sovereignty over the whole island to the East India Company, he used the term Mukim and he followed those divisions. Right? So he followed those divisions. Anyway, I think I will have to move forward a little bit faster, but I want to 
make ask us to recall that Hajar Fatima's plot was not allowed, uh, was not required to pay any lease whatsoever. So it appears in a map as uh, seven plots gratis. I'll come back to that later. But uh, sorry, I mentioned this earlier. This is just to show you in case you were not convinced. Huh? So this is European town, right? Arab Kampong, Bugis Kampong, right at the edge. But if you compare it with this, Bugis town is before the Royal Compound. So it should have been where Middle Road and um, this is Middle Road right here. And so this was Bugis town. They were all asked to relocate to allow for European town. I think I will skip this because this is a little bit uh, esoteric for most of us. But you have the east coast of Singapore as something that is still waiting for more detailed uh, research and discussion. Because you have this 1819 February map which talks about an extensive beach across the eastern end of Singapore. Right? And then it mentions a red river and a freshwater river. And that's very important for shipping. But also, it seems to imply, and here it says Sultan's Negri. The, word, the, the term Negri comes up again. Sultan's Negri, which refers to, of course, the Kampung Glam area. But um, I wanted to point out that it appears in yet another map, this reference to Red River and Freshwater River. There's Sungai Merah, and there's, this doesn't seem to have a name. That's Tanjung Katong right there, the promontory. Um, and Sultan's degree appears here again. So these are more scattered kind of, uh, I put them together. I didn't integrate them into the discussion, but I thought I'll show you what surveyors noted across different maps that does not allow us to you know, separate so clearly you know, this whole inheritance from the pre-1824 or even pre-1819 occupation of Singapore by uh, Malay groups or Malayo Nusantara groups. And mm. I mentioned to you the importance of coconut plantations by the first the very first survey, when the British took notice of what was outside of town boundaries, already you had all these property divisions. Already. Already, so many of them. And all across too, you know. If you had, I, I didn't scan and show, but there were all these property divisions along the East Coast. Very fast. Yeah. Later on, of course, Europeans took over large tracts, but we don't know what happened before. And so the, the claim of the al Sagos that uh, Jafatima already had this land, seems plausible. Now, in this map, it shows that it was empty. This is an 1849 map. Yeah. So it seems, was it not surveyed or something? We don't know. Yeah. And of course, I talk about the topography of the Chukangs. So these are, you know, all the Chukangs are still there. Chua Chukang, Lin Chukang, there's also, uh, sorry, where Seng, Sengkang is also one of them. And then uh, Yo Chukang, there is uh, Peng Kang, and so on. There's so many. Yeah. There's so many of these, but besides that, you have all the uh, Malay place names that dominate the coasts. Sorry. Um, if you also now, if you were to search for the location of Red River and Freshwater River, interestingly enough, they exist to this day. Red River is the Hague Road Canal. You know the Hague Road Canal. That's Red River, and Freshwater is Siglap Canal. That's so fascinating. But not more importantly, there were also this typical of Malay and uh, Bugis agricultural settlements. Uh, this grid division of land by smaller ditches. So Teluk Kurau was well known for a long time as a very Malay settlement. A lot of these ditches were built. Could they, I don't know, we need some further study, but it seems to point to some possible uh, use for uh, agricultural exploitation in the early period. And you look at all of these <coughs> lines here. Yeah? This is Kampung Wat Tanjong right there. Interestingly, the terrain runs in this direction. I mean, I sometimes say this, but I say this with a great degree of caution. It is oriented to the Qibla. Sometimes, it's not always the case. Sometimes, some settlements prefer that orientation. It's easier, your house, than your prayer direction. But I say this with a great deal of caution. No guarantee. Maybe it was just topography. Because here, it doesn't use the Qibla at all. Okay? So a close-up of the fact that plantation, the coconut plantation is still indicated in this very late 1924 map. And at least some of the property owners here were Malay, even at this period. And one example, uh, Malay houses at Tanjong Katong, for example. And it's a Javanese haji, but it's supposed to be Malay houses. So it was quite multi-ethnic. Those connoisseurs of vernacular architecture would, oh, look, it has this old form of windows. Yeah, okay, those, this is very rare today. So on. Some of these, not, these are you know, the translations of Malay architecture into um, either the Rumah Limas, or when it's built up two stories, the compound house. This is the house of Haji Kaha at, from Palembang in Bedok and so on. Now, the, the East Coast was 
the most important built-up area in Singapore as far as this 91, uh, 1941 map of the uh, in preparation for impending, I mean, not preparation for impending war. Yeah, it was, but it was a showing of the built-up areas useful for fighting. Yeah? All the divisions are shown, all the military divisions, and what was opted to be shown as built-up areas include so much of the East Coast. If you took a zooming in, so the, east, the favoured East Coast of Singapore is a legacy of a very long period of such occupation in Singapore history. Earlier I mentioned all the gratis, 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 seven plots to Tuma or Tima. That's Haja Fatima. If you, this is Java Road. This is today uh, Jalan Sultan. This is the defunct or expunged Sumbawa Road. This is the location of Haja Fatima Mosque today. Right? And these seven plots were given to her gratis. Very inexplicable. Mm -hmm. I'm coming to the end, and I want to return to this question of uh, Malay and um, others, or Malay and the wider cosmopolitan society. Now, in the 18th century, Wang, uh, Wang Gangwu notes that in the 18th century, there is a Chinese source, a Hai Kuo Wen Jian Lu, uh, that mentioned, it was compiled in 1730, uh, that and this is Wang Gangwu's observation. Some kind of a Malayu awareness must have emerged and become quite obvious for the Chinese writer to observe. And this is very interesting for Wang Gangwu. He notes that uh, the, the source says Malayu Salat Island or Salatan Island is Borneo. That's Malayu. Banja, South Borneo is different from North Borneo, right? which is Brunei. Sulawesi, Maluku is Malayu Jawa. He's, he left these as questions. What do these mean? Cambodia, the white head Malayu. I'm wondering whether that's a Cham Bani, if you're familiar with the Chams, right? They wear the white uh, sarban. Is that what he's referring to as white Malayu? Because the Chams are Malayo Polynesian rather than Khmer. Luzon, Malayu but Christian. This is an 18th century Chinese source. It's not modern day politics. He knows. I mean, the Chinese could see this. Yeah? Panay, Shebu, Mindanao, Panay and Cebu are Catholic. Also Malayu, says this Chinese source. Kalapa, where's Kalapa? Batavia, Sunda Kalapa. That's the original name for the Chinese. They never called it Batavia, they called it Kalapa. The old Sundanese name for Batavia was retained in Chinese usage all the way into the 18th century. To me, these are all the old inter-ethnic links. They never resorted to the colonial name Batavia. For them, as far as they're concerned, that's still good old Kalapa. I'm not romanticizing it. What I'm saying is that there are these older clues across. Now, this is an inter-Asia thing. Why, why we should do this more? If anything, this is the kind of scholarship that we should be doing, looking at different vernacular or even the term vernacular, maybe we need to discard. Looking at each other's sources, like this. So Wang Gangwu initiated something, like I said, 50s and 60s were the glorious days. You haven't been doing as much since then. Yeah? And of course this, maybe I won't elaborate on this, but this is something, you know, if you go to Malacca, it, the persistence of this older cosmopolitan culture that was shared and yet is open, accommodative and flexible. The term Sembayang is something used, Sembayang is worship. Huh? It's a very old Malay term, it's not Sanskrit. Sembah is homage. Hyang in Malay refers to ancestors, or deities rather, not necessarily ancestors. So the Chiti, Malaka Chiti Shiva Puja is entirely in Malay. The Baba refers to Sembayang Abu for ancestral worship. Why don't they use a Chinese Hokkien term? They use a Malay term. If you're going to say it's just the wives who are Malay, then your ancestor worship is, you use Malay. Sembayang Abu, Abu is ashes. Why didn't you use a Hokkien term? That's how a culture. I mean, now there's a lot of disowning of the Malay ancestry. I mean, it's like, oh no, it was not Malay, it was Batak. Uh, it was not Malay, it was uh, some slave, you know, not Malay. But look at the ling linguistic heritage, the inheritance, that's Sambayang Abu, for something referring to your ancestors, right? Chinese ancestors, no doubt, because the male -like lineage, which is important in Chinese patrilineal society, is not Malay. It was the matrilineal part that was Malay. Yeah, and so on. And Bugis, there was a Bugis Pranakan and Bugis Toto that I mentioned earlier and so on. But for me, what's interesting is this older cosmopolitanism is today in Singapore kind of subdued or forgotten. We, our understanding of cosmopolitanism is very different. We think of it as you know, being worldly in a completely non-regional way. You know, nothing to do with the region. You speak English, that's cosmopolitan. You know, if you speak Bab, is that cosmopolitan? Ah, so, so you, you get what I'm saying? So there's something interesting about colonialism's impact on this older notion of cross-ethnic links, which to me is a form of cosmopolitanism. But today, our idea of cosmopolitanism is entirely different. And it's partly to do with the colonization of port city culture, which in the past was multi-ethnic, and the social glue 
was various forms of accommodative and flexible Malay-based cultural frameworks, such as language and food and dress and so on. And like I said, it's open and accommodative, but it was still based on Malayo-Javanese culture. And finally, I want to just really shatter this myth that uh, you know, when, uh, when, when colonialism came to Singapore, it was all fine and dandy, sultry, tropical island, the British encountered and like, oh, hello, British, come. Not really. Now, the Malays and Javanese of the region had, had witnessed so many. We've already gone through Riau 1784's catastrophe. Now, if you read the right sources, they will remind us that this is the first instance of the direct intervention of the Netherlands army, actually. Not just the VOC armed forces, but the Netherlands army came to destroy Riau. Yes. Yes. The historians have asserted this. Yeah? The historians specializing on this, I mean, not me, because I don't specialize on this. I'm putting it together for our contemplation. Now, Banten in 1808, I think many people don't know this. Banten, and, and again, Banten, I, I'm not showing you images of what an important port it once was. But by 1808, it was limping along because of Batavia's blockades. Batavia was just next door. Batavia used to be Sunda Kelapa, a secondary port to Banten. Okay, so just to give you the background, by the time you reach 1808, Banten was just a mere shadow of its former self. But even that was not enough for Dendles. Ah, this man. He imposed so many demands on the Banten king. Number one, relocate your capital to Anyer. If you know where Anyer is, that's a ridiculous request. Number two, all sorts of ridiculous requests. He refused. Now, when he refused, he was captured, imprisoned, his capital laid to waste. And then, after he was imprisoned in the Fort Spielwake, Spielwake, after a while, he was exiled to Ambon. The Dutch always did that. They exiled the rulers and others who did not listen to them to various places such as South Africa, Ceylon, Ambon, wherever. That's, that's Dutch. So that's what happened to Banten. Now, if you were in Singapore, you think you wouldn't know all these things? Of course you knew. If you were part of the Johoria polity, you would know this, you would know this. You would also know what happened to Yogyakarta. And Peter Carey, who was at the Revisiting Raffles uh, Symposium, bless him, didn't say a word, but he had written about it as the British rape of Yogyakarta. Sorry, Yogyakarta, 1811-1812. He didn't say a word during all the hoo-ha about whether it was good or bad or whatever. He didn't, but if you read his works, you know exactly where he stands. Hmm? I don't know whether you were there at Revisiting Raffles. You remember Peter Carey? Eh? So, Palembang, 1811 to 1812, the destruction and looting was the prelude to Raffles' machinations to aid British conquest of Java. Again, if you read the right sources, uh, some of them are actually Dutch scholars. You will also know this. So, all these are outcomes of various events from the Dutch and then the occupation of the French forces on Java to the British interregnum on Java. So, by the time you get to Singapore's uh, reception of the, I wanted to contextualize that. Now, I also want to end on a few, a few final notes on Raffles' relationship to the Malay world. In a way, we can be rather suspicious of this man in many ways. You know, yeah, so one of the things we can be suspicious about, I'm sorry, I come from Raffles Institution, so I feel like this is a kind of betrayal, but <laughs> yeah, I do, I feel a bit, but that's silly, right? What, captive mind, huh? why am I feeling a sense of betrayal? But, but his crest, includes what, he, what is called the Order of the Golden Soul. Now, on this depiction, which is taken from the Illustrated London News, you have this depiction, which I enlarge, a bit blur, but it's completely different from the typescript used for the RIE logo today. And it says something completely different from the only nobleman of the Golden Sword or Order, Orang Kaya Dari Pedang Emas, that's the name, according to Thomas Forrest, the only such order that we can properly verify, and that is Thomas Forrest, who visited Aceh many times as an agent of the British country traders. He was based at Bengkulen, where Raffles was. Now, from his base, actually, he preceded Raffles also. So, from there, down south in Sumatra, he went up to Aceh many times on trade missions. So, by the time he was quite old, in those days, people died early, if you remember. He was 55 by the time he was conferred the order or the Orang Kaya Dari Pedang Emas Medal. This is the front and back. Inilah cap dikurnia di Bandar Aceh Darussalam dari Shah Bandar Aceh akan kepunyaan Thomas Forrest. I managed to read that. It was a bit difficult because this is rewritten for a lithograph. So, 
that's, that's how I managed to read. So that's quite interesting. Gibson Hill has discussed this at great length. So we are left with a question. Nobody can verify this one for Raffles, you know. And how did he get it when? From what occasion? Nobody really knows. Big question mark. Something we should, I mean, it's right there, emblazoned on his. He was proud of something we are not able to verify. Enough to put it on his coat of arms on, in 1817, very late actually, but before the founding of Singapore. Now, an epilogue. What happened to Temenggong? You know, Singapore was his fifth. He retreated to Singapore. I just want to end with a kind of closure. Right? What happened to Temenggong? You all know. Temenggong dissolved in, no, of course he didn't dissolve in Teluk Blanga. He decided, okay lah, since, you know, I have let go of this whole island, I still have Johor, right? So then, Johor Bahru, a new Johor. The name so evocative, because there's Johor Lama, just like there was Riau Lama, which was founded 1678 or something like that, I can't remember, and then refounded in 1709. But this is Johor Bahru uh, that was established, um, I mean, it was formalized in the 1860s with the construction of very grand. Now, actually, it has three wings, and it's not symmetrical because the internal spatial arrangements followed that of the Malay wooden palace and kind of amalgamated. So, I mean, it's a bit complex to explain, and it's not an architectural lecture, but this is actually not a European building. It's like a Malay building dressed up with European ornamentation. So, the internal layout, the typology, and so on is Malay. It's a Malay palace. But, through to that day and age, you need to dress like a white man. You go to Thailand, it was the same thing, right? There was, a, no, but Thailand came much later. The People's Party ordained that you stop wearing traditional dress. They, they had it emblazoned on all, all sorts of publicity material to wear. And they included the dress of the Malays of Southern Thailand. They had conquered Malay territory. They showed a Malay man, you know? Songko and Kain and don't dress like that. You know, the poster says you must dress like a white man. So this is an early example of dressing like a white man. Yeah, so it was indeed the glorious day and age of colonialism, right? So you have to dress. Even the mosque, typologically, this is Malay. I mean, minus the minarets. This the core building is Malay, with the row of columns in the direction. So there are two major forms of the mosque. This is one of the less major ones. There's a major one has pyramidal hip roof in two or three tiers. This is the Limas Mosque in Johor. So if you look at older photographs of Limas Mosque, such a typology was quite... Um, also quite well known on the peninsula region. And what's interesting I want to point out is that Malay architects and engineers were involved and the Cantonese contractor was uh, recruited for these important projects. I mean, there's so much more to explain, but I'll stop there. And Johor's sovereignty from Britain was beyond doubt when something happened. It's a very complicated thing, you know, about Sultan Abu Bakar and all he did in London. Some of you are very familiar. I mean, he has been called an Anglophile and so on and so forth. But but he, so what was important was he managed to retain Johor's independence from that perspective of his law, of course, right? As a ruler. And so this is a very interesting. What is this? It's not a line, what is this? So from a foreign office clerk, a note was sent to say what store there is set by Abu Bakar, Maharaja of Johor. He's a bona fide. You know how to read this in that rhythm, right? So you can indulge in it, you can look for it. But what it says is it's, he is basically sovereign independent of her and of any feudal tie to the queen. So that's what London felt at that time. Yeah? So, so I, I wanted to really, really just... Uh, and the, the, the railroad that they built was the first in the peninsula. Of course, he borrowed European expertise. And I want to, again, kind of round it off by looking at the Orang Laut, or the Orang Selat, or the Rakyat Singapura. Did they disappear? No, of course not. We vanquished the last remaining cultural forms that we had in Singapore that would have linked us to our pre-1819 past. We had Jong races on Bedok Coast as late as 1963. And slightly later than that, actually. Yeah. And this is a 1962 photograph. Both people living in Bedok. Actually, that's an orang salat. The what? The miserable canoe, remember? What the wretched existence and all that. All those horrible words. But anyway, there. So it did not disappear. It did not. They were there. And in 1980s, the Southern Islanders, who were the last bastions of this old culture, were all asked to destroy their boats unless they register and pay a tax and whatnot. So, I mean, we, now we have dragon boat races. We're very proud of it. I mean, that's fine, but we had jong races. We could build bidoks. We could build Sampan Panjang. I didn't elaborate on Sampan Panjang. 
uh, Gibson Hill wrote a fantastic account of it. These huge double-masted boats built by Singapore's Orang Selat. Yeah. And they always won in regatta races against European vessels. In the mid-19th century, several European accounts talk of them. It's all in Gibson Hill. Okay, so, so basically, I would like to end there. Yeah. I just wanted to show you in case you didn't believe me. So I mean, th this is, I want to end here. Okay, so what I'm doing is today I'm taking a teacher role. I synthesize materials for you. Some of it is my own archival material search, some of it. A lot of it is my synthesizing and, I mean, it's original synthesizing too, I hope you think so. Um, to, to try and make us reorient our perspective, that's all, very simple, right? I'm not inventing anything new except a few conjectures and I main, mentioned them very specifically, this is a conjecture. But really, when we talk about Singapore in the immediate prelude to 1819, I think we really need to shift our focus. Don't keep asking what Europeans were doing, but ask what was happening here and in our neighboring vicinity of the Straits Malay uh, region. Thank you very much. Thank you.